much, Hannah. Now, um, we promised that we'd be interviewing Dr. Becky Bendor Samuel, who um, who's a doctor working in an accident and emergency ward in a London hospital. As it happens, we did interview her on Thursday. The reason we can't do it live now is because um, she's actually at work. So we thought, let's, let's pre-record it and then we'll play it. However, a number of issues have arisen. And so what we're going to do is put that recording up on the Real Lives website and instead, we're scraping the barrel a little. We've gone for another doctor and uh, it, great privilege really to be interviewing Dr. Ruth Erdley. And um, at the last minute, really, she's, she stepped in, but I think you'll really enjoy her. So Ruth, if you're there, let me say a very hearty thanks for joining us. Um, welcome. Where are you joining us from? Where's home for you? I'm in Great Glen in Leicester. Okay, and you're a GP? I'm a GP in Leicestershire. Okay, now you're, you're clearly very young. You've not been a GP for long. <laughs> About how many years? Uh, 30 or so, 30 odd years, yeah. Oh, I've been wow. a doctor, doctor for 35 years and a GP for 30. Oh, wow, you should go on a, an Oil of You Lay advert, I think. But anyway, let's find out a little bit about you. How, um, where, where were you brought up? I was born in the south, but I was brought up in Loughborough. Um, which is the other side of Leicester from here. And we mm -hmm. moved there in the mid sixties because my dad got a job there. And I grew up in Loughborough, um, went to state schools in Loughborough and my parents um, were founder members of Hollywell Church in, in Loughborough, which is quite a busy church popular with students these days. It is, I think it's where Hannah herself goes to church, so that, that's great. And um, were, were you brought up in a Christian family or not, really? Yes, my parents were Christians. And was it imposed on you? Did you were, you were you made to believe in the way that they did? Well, yes, I mean, <laughs> there was a bit of indoctrination, of course. Um, I was catechised, for those that don't know, you know, you, you, you get tested on... Um, on Bible verses and doctrine, and I had to go to Sunday school whether I liked it or not. And did you um, like it? Um, sometimes. <laughs> All right. And I had to go to church. I had to go to church whether I liked it or not. <laughs> but I liked know. the I liked the youth meetings. What the boys? No, the girls actually. I, <laughs> I had lots of lots of friends who used to come with me. We had okay. a good time. So when, when for yourself, Ruth did, Ruth, did you become a Christian? Do you remember? I remember stages, Roger. Uh, it all started really, and it, it's, it's tied in with why I became a doctor. Uh, when I was about 11, I decided I was going to be an eye surgeon. And uh, this happened because the physics teacher asked us to bring a, a bullseye into the classroom uh, in order to dissect it. Uh, I don't know if anybody else remembers those fantastic diagrams that you did um, showing refraction and the lens of the eye and how the image was focused on the retina. Anyway, we were to bring a bullseye in and dissect it in physics. Um, there was a dual motive here. I thought this would be absolutely fascinating. And also I had a rather squeamish friend and I wanted to terrify her with the... Um, <laughs> With the, with the bullseye, with the pathological specimen. Um, she became a Christian later, actually, but it, I don't recommend it as a form of evangelism. <laughs> um, but, but I was fascinated with biology and how things worked. And I liked maths and physics and chemistry, but it was biology, really. And I sort of accepted that God had made the eye and uh, the teacher would use words like, um, complex, intricate, designed. And I just thought, oh, all things bright and beautiful. The Lord God made them all. Obviously it's, it's created and I'm going to be an eye surgeon. And um, I never achieved those dizzy heights, of course. I did do a job in ophthalmology, but even later when I did a job in ophthalmology, the eye surgeons to a man, and they were all men, would often use the same terms. They would really talk about irreducible complexity. I know that idea has been, some people say it's been debunked, but they used words like improbable and 
almost miraculous and, and things like this when talking about just the human eye. And that's just such a small part because that's supported by the cardiovascular and the respiratory and the lymphatic and the endocrine and the neurological systems, not to mention the brain itself, which nobody really understands. And I, I, I suppose I was a theist. I believed in God um, from the age of 11 just through just through what I'd been taught at school, um, really more than what I'd been taught at home. I accepted that, but I, I was convinced that it was the only explanation. We we're also taught um, evolutionary theory at the same time, as in origins, as in um, macro evolution. There's plenty of evidence for micro evolution, change between in, within a species, of course. But even my biology teachers and physics teachers said that um, it was highly improbable that these things would have evolved and they weren't Christian. So I mm. believed in God mm. first, Roger. Mm. And, and believing in God, of course, doesn't necessarily make you a Christian. There was a moment, presumably, when you were going to put your trust in Jesus Christ as well. That's right. And go on. Well, at a youth meeting, one one day one evening I was asked to give my testimony in other words to say how I'd become a Christian and this is a little bit of a problem for me because I hadn't actually made a profession of faith I'd probably be about 15 and then I thought well am I a very wicked sinful person answer yes do I believe that Jesus is the son of God and is the perfect man? And do I believe he died, really died? And do I believe he was buried and rose again? And have I put my trust in him? Oh, yes, I wonder when that happened. And I found that the answer to all those questions, um, did I trust in the Lord Jesus? And did I, was I confident, was all my confidence in him? The answer to those questions was yes. So, I gave my testimony that evening, but I, I honestly couldn't put a date on it. OK. Now, I think when you were, um, as you say, growing up in the 60s, it was very much the sort of mindset that uh, girls would become nurses and boys doctors. Is, is, was that true of you? I had a nurse's uniform when I was about five. <laughs> I wanted to be a vet, really, but I wasn't clever enough to be a vet. <laughs> <laughs> so I had to be a doctor. Oh, no, right. no, I, I am. Um, I, I, I liked animals, but um, I, I toyed with the idea of being a vet. You did need higher grades. You need, you needed higher grades. James Herriot made veterinary medicine very popular in the seventies, but I, um, I, I, I always really wanted to be a doctor. I just was too sentimental with animals. I still think they're little people in furry coats and <laughs> I get I get I find paediatrics quite veterinary that there's a small creature that can't communicate properly and might bite you and um, but uh, but I but I I think I always want to be a doctor I'm very very fortunate very blessed to to be doing a job when I'm nearly 60 that I still really really love doing okay so you're working full-time as a GP I'm working part time as a GP. OK, but I know as well, uh, you're not just any old GP. You were the the doctor that people would write to in the Leicester Mercury. You had a column there. Ask the doctor for <laughs> 17 years. Yeah, I, yeah, I did. Yeah. I, can I ask you what was the most unusual question or funniest question you were ever asked? Well, sometimes I tried to be funny. And that was usually when it all went wrong, Roger. Um, somebody wrote to ask whether they should buy a feeder phone. It was costing 30 pounds or 35 pounds. And um, I think you could buy it in America actually. And uh, so I don't know how many dollars, but it came from America because it was spelt with um, an F-E-T rather than F-O-E, feeder phone. It was for speaking to your unborn child. Oh, and I see. somebody oh, wrote in, somebody wrote in to say, if I buy a feeder phone and put it on my wife's um, tummy and speak to my unborn infant, will it improve their grades at GCSE? <laughs> and your answer? Well, I wrote this answer, which I considered very witty. And um, I didn't 
didn't usually buy the paper or anything, you know, I, I just, but that evening I read it or the, the, the evening after I read it in the, in the Chinese takeaway on the way home from work. And I thought, oh, what a witty response and aren't I clever? And I got about four complaints about that letter <laughs> saying that this doctor, this newspaper doctor was obviously a pig headed chauvinist male and uh, was patronizing to this pregnant woman and her husband and ought to be <laughs> ought to be struck off <laughs> wonderful all right now let's come on to um you're, you're a christian you're a doctor what difference does it make that you are a christian doctor do you think in your everyday practice it makes all the difference in the world and the biggest one is that i feel i can truly empathize with people because I truly have no airs and graces in that I I know from the scripture that we're all in it together we're all in the same boat all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and so it makes me a lot less judgmental than I might otherwise have been so I don't think to myself I would never do drugs um, I would never be an alcoholic I would never get a sexually transmitted infection or um, uh, get, get pregnant by the wrong man. You know, I just know that I'm capable of all those things and far worse. And in fact, I, I'm amazed at how brave and resilient and kind and sensible most of my patients are. They, they knock me into a cocked hat, as they say. But I know that we're all in it together and uh, because all have sinned. So I, I feel it, it gives me empathy. I think as well, sympathy, which is different, isn't it? Um, I work in quite a middle class area, and yet there is a lot of sadness, a lot of um, uh, addiction, dependency, sometimes just dependency on material things. And I think of that hymn, spirits oppressed by pleasure, wealth and care. And, and I see that quite a lot. And people have the same needs, whether they're you know whatever class they are whatever their bank balance says they've got the same they've got the same needs and um so i think it helps with empathy and it helps it helps with sympathy um you, you clearly get to know people very well do you do you pray for your patients i always pray for my patients uh, and i consider this a benefit of, of a short commute it's only about 20 minutes from my house to the surgery and uh, whilst I'm praying, I keep my eyes open. Good. <laughs> yes. But I, I pray on the way in and I pray on the way home. What individually, you pray specifically for individual patients you've met? As I go in, I pray in general. As I leave, I pray specifically. Because it's a hard job. Um, and we're only human and we're going to make mistakes. So I probably a bit like, people who preach you know you pray that God will take away anything stupid or wrong that you've said and that he will um help patients um to to act upon your management plan if it's appropriate for them sometimes they've told you what that is actually and also you pray that the Lord will heal them because you're only an agent of healing aren't you that it's it's God who does the actual he healing even if he does it through natural means sometimes I pray for supernatural means as well mm. do you does it frustrate you sometimes that you just don't have any medication or you don't have the answer to a particular problem or something is terminal you'd love to be able to help but you can't does that upset you yes it, do, it does upset me um when I was young I used to find general practice quite frustrating I used to think here am I I was going to be an eye surgeon and now somebody's come in um with some social problem like they want a week off because their dogs died or something like that but as you get older you realize that for example if a dog dies it is a bereavement and it is significant and people want to talk about it so you can't fix things like that but more seriously you can't fix things like broken marriages or more commonly broken hearts and broken relationships and um sometimes you do just want you just want to cry sometimes you want to cry um 
as you go home and sometimes you want to cry with the patient and this is where prayer comes in because of course we can't any of us fix anything um and sometimes it doesn't require fixing and sometimes god doesn't want to fix it he wants to use it um but that's in it that that's um that's for him to decide so as i drive home i, I don't, don't often bring problems home i usually leave it with the lord on the journey and trust trust him hmm. and his sovereignty you say you want to talk to people but ruth you've only got 10 minutes does that frustrate you sometimes it frustrates the patients <laughs> are you sometimes do you think sometimes 10 minutes is too long with some of them well sometimes if it's an in, <laughs> if it's an ingrained toenail but i had a lovely man in his 90s and he brought a huge list it, it's not as long as one of my colleagues had they had 36 things on a list once but we've been through his heart disease and his asthma and his copd and his cancer and his uh, social security and all that and i i my computer was flashing more pa patients more patients you're running late more patients so i tried graciously as i thought to wrap it up and he said not so fast young lady <laughs> <laughs> I haven't finished yet. <laughs> well, he paid his, his, his national insurance all his life, so he's going to get his money's worth. Um, well, that's right. Ruth, on serious issues now, um, not that that wouldn't be serious for him, I'm sure it was, but the COVID-19, the, um, the pandemic, which the reason we're, we're, we're watching on Zoom is because of the lockdown, etc. It, it is stunning, isn't it? Um, and I'd just like to ask you a little bit about uh, how this has impacted you and uh, your GP. Some of your patients must have been uh, infected. What's, what's it doing to you? How's it changing things for you as a doctor? It, it's changed things for everybody in, in healthcare um, and on the front line. I include care home staff in that as well. And all health professionals have been affected by this, of course. Um, for myself, it means that most of my consultations now are on the phone and only some are face to face. So we call this triage. We say, oh, oh yes, you need to come down and you need to be seen. Um, and uh, but but many consultations are on the phone. So there are safety issues there. And uh, I've been sent quite a lot of interesting pictures of rashes uh, <laughs> taken on mobile phones and various other bodily parts for analysis. <laughs> And that sometimes works and it sometimes doesn't. Um, but uh, there's a lot of fear. People are very mm. afraid. Um, in the medical profession, we're not afraid of the virus so much. Uh, we, we were hoping we've had it because we think we might have a bit of immunity, some of us. But um, people are afraid for their relatives. They're feeling a bit trapped and lonely, some people, not being able to see their their relatives, their grandchildren, their children. And there's a lot of fear. I think uh, we could say it's not a fear of the virus, it's a fear of dying from it. And it seems so random and so frightening. You know, when healthcare staff go home, I go home, I've got PPE, I've got a uh, visor, I've got goggles, I've got all the kit, but is it in my hair? Is it on my skin? Is it in my shoes? It, it's an invisible, enemy isn't it mm. I, i'm sorry to do this in some ways but i'm going to drop something on you um that since january 21st uh, there have been 308,000 deaths worldwide from covid19 but since the same date 2.69 million people have died of starvation and there have been 14 million abortions how did you how do you react to that? It's grim, isn't it? Um, you mentioned abortion. You see, I do a lot of gynecology as a GP because um, there are not that many uh, women in the practice. So I just by virtue of my uh, my gender, I do a lot of gynecology and I see a lot of um, young women um asking for an abortion asking for a termination of pregnancy 
But you see, they've been through this educational system. Does it tell them that they're made in the image of God and that they have a, any value? And does it, does it say the same for their unborn child? It says, no, you're just, you're, you're just abstract. You've come about by accident. You're a series of, of random mutations and your child is just a, a cluster of cells. So most women who have a termination of pregnancy these days, they really do not know what they're doing. They really don't know what they're doing. And when they find out, perhaps later on when they do have a child and they do have a scan and see the scan and the sonographer doesn't deliberately turn the screen away as they do when they're planning to terminate the pregnancy, lest the mother should see the heartbeat and change her mind. But when they actually have a baby, they often bitterly regret the decision they made five, 10, 15 years earlier. So abortion is a, is, a, is, a, is a disgrace to our nation, but it's also a global tragedy. And starvation too, you know, we care so much about this coronavirus because it's going to uh, take our loved ones and strike us and hit our economy. But um, God is a God of justice and, and he cares, and he cares about the, the poor. And um, I suppose it underlines to me that um, we're all going to die because it's not just starvation and abortion. We're, we're all going to die. I think there's 10 million deaths worldwide a year with cancer and about 18 million from cardiovascular diseases. There's about, on a worldwide scale here, there's about 800,000 800, suicides a year. So whether you die of ill health or in an accident or at your own hand, um, it's appointed unto all of us wants to die and after that the judgment and um these are very so sobering statistics mm. they are um when you were studying at university where, where did you study by the way i studied in leicester when you were studying medicine science you must have faced the issue you know how can how can a christian believe you know when there's so much scientific evidence apparently which is contradictory to the christian faith how, how did you cope with that sort of pressure maybe from the lecturers uh, but certainly from you know fellow students there was pressure but i have to say that because i um uh because from an early age really my father had foreseen that there would be that if i was to study med medicine there would be ethical um issues and so from from quite a young age pretty much from the time that i professed faith at about the age of 15 i was reading about medical ethics and i felt i felt very confident of my ground um having read people older and wiser and more learned than myself um uh, i read schaefer and um uh, whatever happened to the human race and i um and, and christian ethics from an evangelical uh, perspective and also um i read about creation and to me the thing that had first convinced me of the existence of god was i was convinced uh, that that um it sounds like an academic exercise doesn't it i know conversion is not an academic exercise but the thing that first convinced me that there was a god was as I said to you, the complexity of living organisms, not just rules and, and uh, enzymes and chemistry, but, but life, life itself, which still nobody can really understand or explain. And um, I felt it was a far greater step of the imagination to believe in random forces or a big bang or a universe that, well, it just exists, like Bertrand Russell said, that's not an explanation nobody can explain it and i felt that the christian faith what the bible said gave a fitting logical reasonable well argued convincing explanation for the origins of life and the state of the planet i still believe it and i felt i was on strong ground and come what may and some things were thrown at me so once literally um but uh, Come what may, I was I stood my ground, and I took that verse in the Old Testament: uh, "Whoever honours me, I will honour." Hmm. 
Interesting. Yeah, I won't ask the details of, of how something was thrown at you, but what was it <laughs> that was literally thrown at you? A surgical instrument was thrown at me. Oh, right. OK. Um, just talking about surgical in in instruments, we, I'm, I'm going to come on to some very serious, deep topics in a moment. But um, I gather on one occasion you performed a surgical operation on your husband, but it wasn't, <laughs> in, a, it wasn't in a doctor's surgery or a hospital. What, what exactly happened? Well, it was a frontal lobotomy, of course. Um, no, that's very mean. I don't know who's told you that, Roger. Um, <laughs> my husband split his hand and once and not wanting to waste time at casualty I had a, a scout around in my bag and I hadn't got any sutures so I just got my sewing kit out and <laughs> no anaesthetic and a bit of black thread it looked quite shocking <laughs> and, and do you recommend we should do the same if we don't want to queue up at A&E well it is I don't think he's got a scar he hasn't complained anyway <laughs> All right, now some, some big questions, if you don't mind, Ruth. Um, the whole issue of suffering, you know, you're, you're, you're seeing it all the time, aren't you? And, and I'm a Christian worker. The question I get asked more than any other is, if there's a God of love, why does he allow suffering? Now, John Lennox dealt with this a little bit last week. And by the way, I want to just say, if any of you have got any questions you want to ask Ruth or Dr. Carl in a few minutes, please do text them in or send them, well, there's something going on the screen. There we are. There we are. There's the phone number 07946852071, or go to slido.com with the, um, the code 2269. Send in the questions and we'll put them to Ruth or Dr. Carl uh, shortly. But Ruth, going back to the question for you, the, the whole issue of suffering, why does God allow suffering? He's a God of love, he's all powerful, and yet the things that are going on in the world, you know, that statistic, 2.69 million dying of starvation since the end of January this year. And why is God permitting this? Well, uh, I suppose that's a question um, for a theologian rather than a medic. I'd, the, my patients that I see who are suffering, and some do suffer terribly, I've never seen a case where I felt um, that it was a punishment from God directly um, because I feel, I've always felt, well, I haven't got that cancer or I've not got that suffering and I'm just, just as bad as they are. And I always think of that what Jesus said about the man born blind when people asked, who sinned? Was it this man or his parents that he was born blind? And Jesus said, neither this man nor his parents sinned that he was born blind, but that the power of God should be displayed in his life. And I have known people, in fact, I met one not long ago, who came to faith through intense suffering, either mental or physical, and the Lord used the suffering in order to bring them to himself, in order to sort of reset their focus and sh shout at them really get get their get their attention it's not to say suffering's good suffering's miserable and horrible but that god but that god allows it for some reason um so much we br do bring on ourselves of course and and uh, there is so much in injustice and poverty and things that we should be doing something about um, as a as a planet, I suppose that's beyond my 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 ken. But um, on an individual level, I know that God does use these things to bring people to Himself. So they go through something that's short term bad, if you know what I mean, for long term good, for redemption, for spiritual life, for for hope um, in life and in death. Mm, okay, Ruth. Um... I've noticed that those who claim to be healers and who run healing meetings have been very silent with regard to the coronavirus. They don't seem to be going anywhere near the hospitals or the care homes to, to heal those with this virus. But in the past, have you ever been to a healing meeting? And what, what's your view of these people who say they've got supernatural powers to heal the sick? <laughs> I wish I'd got them. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Well, I've seen healing meetings. They make your hair stand on end, don't they, really? Um, my view, and I'm not ready for this question. Thank you, Roger. <laughs> my view is that in the New Testament sense, in the New Testament sense of healing, we don't see miracles like that today. There may be exceptions. I have read of exceptions and, and uh, there may be exceptions sometimes in parts of the world which are particularly dark and dangerous for the, for the gospel. But in places like um, in the Western world where we have the scriptures in our own language and all the advantages of centuries of Christian, um, a Bible study and Christian teaching, I, I don't believe that we have miracles in the sense that we don't have supernatural events. We don't have instantaneous healing as Christ did, instantaneous, complete healing, organic healing, a shriveled hand, plumping up the flesh and regrowing, uh, blind eyes seeing, the dead raised. We don't have instantaneous, complete lasting organic healing we do have and i have seen it functional healing but functional healing by definition by which i mean let's say um in the case of the coronavirus there's a functional problem the body is infected it's mounting an, an immune response but the immune response is not sufficient or then you die from the virus or the immune response is overzealous and you die from the organ damage caused by your own body's overzealous immune response that that's that's what's happening so a functional healing might be that the function of the immune system i hope i'm making myself clear here well yes it, it, it's, it's not organic it's not a it's not a change like my my amputated arm growing back or my amputated leg growing back, but it's a functional change within the body that something to do with the chemistry changes. Mm. And, and, it, it, and it could happen naturally, but mm. I do believe that God sometimes acts supernaturally to accelerate or uses natural um, processes like that, probably more commonly than we realize in order to heal us. And I believe sometimes in answer to prayer but I don't I wouldn't endorse a healing meeting I would never encourage anybody to go and see a healer and I'm sorry to say that um, it's not just online where there are charlatans um, Ruth you, you you will see patients who are dying and supposing you're in the terrible situation where you, you you know there's somebody dying maybe of the coronavirus but it could be something else and um, and they're, they're terrified of death. What can you as a, an NHS doctor say or do? Well, the General Medical Council did give us new guidelines a few years ago, and partly because of um, uh, advice from the Christian Medical Fellowship and other organisations, they did include a properly holistic approach to medicine, which includes the spiritual. So as an NH NHS doctor, um, I'm certainly not penalized for considering the spiritual aspect of a consultation. In fact, it is expected. So that's, that's a great help to Christian doctors. Um, if somebody was to, um, if I knew that somebody was a Christian and they were, um, afraid of dying or afraid of the process of dying and asked me specific questions I would answer them as a Christian I might share a bible passage if they asked me to pray I would pray with them but they it has to come from the, the patient and um, what I try to do is I try to um, signpost people I don't feel it is my place as a doctor to pressurize people into sharing my faith. I don't believe I can convert anybody, of course. And I don't believe that I found the good shepherd, but I believe that he found me when I was lost. Um, you know, I, I thought I was doing a lot of thinking about the Christian faith and did it stack up and was it true? But it wasn't really like that at all. 
So I try to signpost people. I might ask them, do you have a faith? Would you like me to ask the chaplain to visit you? I'm, I'm fortunate to work in a town where there are lots of wonderful Christians and um, I, can, I can bank on their help if, if my patient would like to have a visit from them. But I don't get somebody's arm halfway up their back and, you know, read them John 3.16 because let's say a member of my family was vulnerable and ill and perhaps terminally ill in hospital and they had a Buddhist doctor and they said, I'm frightened of dying. Would I want an Islamic doctor or a Hindu doctor or a Buddhist doctor to try to convert my dying relative round to their way of thinking? We are not to put undue pressure on people or to take advantage of their vulnerability because that would be unethical, but we are allowed to ask questions um, and signpost them. And really that's all we can do in evangelism, isn't it? Point people to Jesus. I'm happy to talk about Jesus. I'd love to talk about Jesus, but it's got to come from the patient. But that's where the secret weapon comes in, Roger, prayer. <laughs> because uh, because uh, when Jesus is seeking someone uh, and or pursuing them, as in the case of C.S. Lewis, who's already been mentioned tonight, um, it's irresistible. <laughs> Time's gone, Ruth, but I do want to ask you this. Now, it's very personal, but um, supposing it was you that was dying, would you be certain of going to heaven or is it just something you hope for because you've been a kind doctor and all the rest? Do you have any confidence of heaven? Do you fear hell for yourself? No, uh, I am. Um, nobody looks forward to the process of dying. If they do, they're a bit odd. Um, everybody wants a peaceful death uh, at a good old age, preferably. And we don't want to leave those we love in the lurch. You know, a lot of us have got a lot of responsibilities. But um, I have confidence in the Lord Jesus Christ as my saviour. And what I could not do for myself, live a righteous life, and what I could not do for myself, get right with God, or do anything to appease my creator, uh, to whom I owe my very self. Christ did for me, Christ did for me. And uh, I am um, I might be an inadequate person and I'm often an, ad an inadequate doctor, uh, but Christ is adequate, he's, he's more than adequate. And my whole confidence is, is in him. And I do believe, um, like the Pilgrim Pilgrim's Progress that and I shall cross that river and um, I shan't cross it alone. He will be with me and I shall reach the other side and all the trumpets will sound even for me. And it's because of what Jesus has done rather alone. than what you've done. Yes. Alone, in Christ alone. Mm. Ruth, you've been a great um, um, scraping the barrel for us. Thank you very, very much. Um, that, that's tremendous, most interesting. A lot of issues raised there. And I say again, if you do want to ask any questions, text them or slide over them in. Um, but Ruth, we'll come back to you in a few minutes um, for the question time, but thank you very, very heartily. Thank you very much. Um, but it's, it's tremendous to have Dr. Carl with us. And um, he, he works overseas, he works in, um, in, um, in Wales, but it's, it's good to have him with us here today, wherever you are. Um, we're going to go over to Carl just to explain to us what exactly it means to become a Christian. Carl. Yeah, well, thanks very much, uh, Ruth and uh, Roger, for that interview. That was really stimulating and uh, it was great to hear. And uh, welcome to everyone. And uh, yes, I'm here in Wales and uh, in lockdown, we still aren't able to, to go out. And like you experiencing COVID-19 um, situation, I don't know how it's affecting you in your area, but, um, but, but we're enjoying certain things about it and uh, other things are less, are less good. I heard this week um, that in Chinese, the, um, the, the word for crisis is made up of two characters. Uh, the first character means uh, danger and the second character means opportunity and uh, I thought that was quite a perceptive and optimistic uh, view from Wuhan and um, I thought about that in regard to Covid. It's definitely a crisis isn't it we're all facing. The danger part we understand 
you know, there's been over 30,000 people dying and that's probably an underestimate and it's only the first peak. Uh, people are separated from their families. Uh, jobs have gone, businesses have gone under the economy struggling. I'm sure by the end of this year, um, every family will have been touched by COVID and uh, we'll all have stories to tell. So the, the danger side, I think we're all very well aware of. The opportunity side is something which um, I suppose is perhaps less obvious, although people are talking about the post-COVID uh, world. Um, it, it, COVID has stopped wars. I mean, the war in Yemen was discontinued because of, uh, of COVID. And certainly our NHS and um, loads of things in our society will be changed after COVID. And for us as well, th this is a time of, um, of opportunity. For most of us, life has slowed down. Um, and, um, and so we've got time on our hands. Uh, our attention has been taken away from the sort of glitzy celebrity culture that we were a little bit obsessed with before. And, and now we find ourselves thinking about real heroes, delivery van drivers and care home workers and um, you know, people who keep our communities ticking over in the background. Um, and maybe as well, with time on our hands, we've be been able to think of some of the the bigger questions which Rogers raised with Ruth, but we've been able to think about them for ourselves. And if death has come close, sometimes the glib answers, which seemed okay when death seemed a long way off, are not quite so satisfying when, as Ruth said, it could happen to me. And uh, what would I think? Where would I go? So tonight I wanted to think about the COVID situation through those words of Jesus, which we, um, which we heard earlier from the, the book of Luke. Um, it's not the healthy who need a physician, but the sick and uh, calling sinners to repentance. Um, health, the word Jesus used for health means whole, just like whole food is healthy food. And it was good to hear Ruth talking about this, the idea of uh, Jesus being interested in us as body, soul and spirit. Um, Jesus isn't a, a sort of disease doctor who's just interested in your pancreas or your nerve endings. He's actually interested in you as a whole person. And uh, we're all very interested in our bodies at the moment. You know, are we old or are we young? Have we got a, a background health problem or um, are we generally fit and well? So I think COVID has focused our attention on our bodies um, and our mental health as well. That's becoming increasingly um, a concern, isn't it? The the lockdown has stripped away so many of our supports. We can't speak to people or meet people easily. And we can't go out and we can't enjoy nature. We can't exercise and all those things are restricted. So there's a lot of depression and there's a lot of anxiety uh, around. And there's a worry about how that's gonna work out when, when the virus becomes less of a, of a problem. We're still gonna have that hanging around. But you know, it's quite interesting. That there's not much talk about spiritual problems. Um, if you listen to the, the media a lot, in fact, you'd think we were just animals, that we just had bodies and, uh, and maybe we're intelligent, emotional animals. But there's no mention of the spiritual uh, issues which this disease raises. And yet we are all of us thinking about death. I, I wonder whether you, I certainly have wondered, well, if I got it uh, and I was faced with that um, chance of dying, um, how would I feel? People close to me have died, people I've known have died. And, um, and so you think, oh, how would it be for me? And it, that's a spiritual question. Where would I go? What will happen to me? And I realize I'm not just biology. There is more uh, to this question than just my last breath and heartbeat. So Jesus very much believed in the spiritual side of life and um, he believed in looking after people, body, soul and spirit. And he also saw that spiritual problems were really very important and, and they were actually the basis for other problems. So, um, you know, that problems in the spiritual life could affect the body and the mind. Uh, he's a great doctor in that sense. He doesn't worry so much about the symptoms. He goes straight for the cause. And uh, in this passage, he says, well, look, the cause of sickness is sin. And, uh, and the idea of sin is in a very popular world that, to be fair, doctors are really used. We talk about mucus and urine and all sorts of other horrible things. Uh, so we're used to using unpopular words. And Jesus was the same. He used that word um, sin freely. And he said, no, it's a spiritual problem. Beneath our, um, uh, our physical and mental health needs, there is a, a spiritual fracture. 
a dislocation, a breakage. And uh, we've all created with a God shaped hole within us, a need for a relationship with God. And when, and when that's empty, we fill it with other things, but never in a satisfying way, never in a full way. And uh, that, that emptiness affects us in many, many ways. And Jesus said, we call that sin, that brokenness, uh, he calls that sin. And he says, look, that is the root from which problems with our bodies and problems with our mental health um, is ultimately uh, derived. And, um, and that's a, a really, really hard diagnosis. I don't know, I mean, in my work as a GP, like Ruth, I work as a general practitioner as well. And uh, I sometimes do have to break bad news and, uh, you know, a test result comes in or a specialist contacts me and um, that's never an easy, never an easy thing. And people react in different ways. Some people deny it. And, um, you know, they say, no, it can't be right. The test must be wrong. I feel so well. I, you know, that's that's not me. I, I, and they don't believe it. And uh, you have to sort of let them argue that out, let them get their unbelief out of their system before you can proceed to treatment. And uh, for some diseases, the, the intractable denial phase can last for ages. Some mental health diagnosis, people never accept it. And um, it can, they can't get any treatment because they refuse to accept the diagnosis. And if you were to hear the diagnosis that Jesus places on all our lives, that we are sinners, I wonder how you feel. And I think quite often people react as though their inner lawyer leaps up and starts saying, you know, well, no, I'm not so bad. And that person over there is worse than me. And uh, actually, who are you to talk? You, you're sick. You've got bigger problems than I have. And, you know, you've got to let that argument run its course. God lets us argue. But ultimately, when it's all blown away, the diagnosis still stands. Um, cancer is a hard word. It's a hard diagnosis. Nobody wants to hear that diagnosis uttered over them. But if cancer's the problem, it has to be named and it has to be faced. And Jesus knew about that. He was a great physician uh, in that sense. Um, some people, and these are much um, easier to deal with, when you speak to them um, about a bad diagnosis, they say, you know, I knew there was something. I knew something was wrong. I didn't know what it was, but I knew something was wrong. And it's the same spiritually. When you talk to some people about their condition, immediately they recognize, oh, yeah, you know, I, my relationship with God's rubbish. You know, I, and that, you know, really is a need uh, in my life. That, that's a gift from God, that, that tender conscience, that uh, awareness uh, of something broken inside. Um, I don't get on with myself. I don't get on with other people. I, I've broken uh, my fellowship with God. And, you know, once you've reached that position, once you've moved through denial into that position of acceptance, then and only then can you really move on um, to treatment. And um, and you know that that's it's fantastic news here. This is why, as a doctor, I love to talk about the gospel uh, whenever I get the opportunity because this is a really serious situation for which we have a fantastic solution. And that doesn't happen in medicine very often. So um, it's really great in, in, in theology or in evangelism to be able to say, yeah, look, this is serious. Thank goodness you've recognized that. But there is a 100 percent effective treatment and the treatment is repentance. Um, and not all treatments are popular with patients. I don't know whether Ruth agrees with me, but I think patients quite like tablets especially once a day tablets that are easy to swallow or that you can dissolve in water um, and that don't have side effects. And at a push, they might go, okay, I'll have an operation. But once you start talking about diet plans and exercise programs and things like that, they sort of glaze over and uh, those are much less acceptable uh, treatments. And repentance is a, is a slightly unpopular treatment. It seems people would want to do almost anything other than repent. But Jesus says that is the only treatment that is gonna solve the problem of sin and this broken relationship with God. And he told a story about repentance. It, it's a famous story about a man who had two sons and the younger son um, wanted the inheritance and um, took it from his father and, um, and went to a far country, left home, lived life for himself and um, spent it all. And that was fine until a crisis came, until a COVID-19 moment perhaps. And then suddenly the money was gone, the famine had come, and he was in want. 
And at that crisis point, he experienced repentance. And uh, the, the, the story goes on how he changed his mind towards his father and he began to think, oh, I, I really would be better off being home with my father. And he recognized his sin and he recognized that he needed to be forgiven. And his whole attitude changed and he turned around and he went back to his dad and Jesus said, that's repentance. Uh, and of course, when he got home, his father welcomed him with open arms. And um, if we're going to have our sin sorted out, we have to come to that position where we recognize that we are sinners, that we need forgiveness and that we need to be welcomed back into God's family. And Jesus says, if you do that, then you know, your sin can be sorted out. And how does it work? How does the repentance sort the sin problem out? Well, it doesn't make it evaporate. It doesn't make the sin just sort of vaporize. No, the sin was taken from my life and your life, and it was laid on somebody else, and it was punished in them. And 2,000 years ago, the physician that we're reading about in this passage in Luke, Jesus took the sickness and the sin in my life and your life and everybody's life. And he bore it in his own body on the tree and he paid the full and sufficient penalty. And uh, as Ruth said in her final answer, it's enough. God is satisfied with that payment. Uh, and we just need uh, to trust that uh, for ourselves. Uh, I don't know whether Ruth's the same as me, but I spend quite a lot of my time explaining how to take treatment. There's nothing more frustrating uh, to a doctor than patients returning and saying that, um, you know, they've uh, they've tried the treatment and it didn't work. And then when you ask them uh, the, the question, well, how did what did you do? You discover that uh, you're like the house uh, scene where the person sprayed their uh, Ventolin inhaler by their neck or one of uh, a long time ago, I met somebody who who took his Vic orally rather than uh, in a vapor. Um, then, uh, you know, they, they've taken it in a completely uh, incorrect way. So it's important to take it properly. And repentance is something which happens in your heart. It's not anything outward in, in initially. It may turn into outward things. It definitely will. But it starts in your heart, inside, where you really are. And it's uh, no place for hiding or pretending or evading. You have to ha deal with this situation, this broken relationship, honestly, inside. And it's communicated through prayer. The Bible talks about calling out to God. And the prayer of the Son uh, in the prodigal son, the, the, the young man concocts a prayer for his father on the way home. It's a good model um, if you want to pray a prayer of repentance, and we'll pray one together at the end. But he says sorry for his sin, and he asks God to forgive him. I'm no longer worthy. I'm going to need to be forgiven, and I'm going to need to be welcomed into your family. And those are the elements of the prayer that we need to pray, and then we can totally rely upon the treatment. How do I know this? Well, like Ruth, I believe the Bible. I trust the Bible and um, I believe the words of Jesus and I believe they're definitely true. But also I know it to be true myself. Um, when I was 17, I came to a crisis in my own life. Um, I haven't done anything really terrible, but I just knew this brokenness. I, I had my uh, crisis moment and I realized that inside me was a God-shaped hole that I wasn't able to fill. And I went through the stages of repentance that this young man in the story went through. And I said I was sorry. And I, I trusted God to forgive me and to welcome me back. And, you know, I did feel something that Sunday night in September when I was 17. But what I found is that as I've continued to trust in this over my life since that time, I found it to be even more certain and even more secure. And I know for certain, and I have thought about this, that whatever COVID does to me, I can be confident that God has me in his hand and I don't need to be afraid. And I would love for that to be true for everyone listening this evening. We're going to say a short prayer now, just a very um, a, a prayer which, if you pray it and you mean it, uh, can be for you a way in to rebuilding and repairing this relationship with your father in heaven. And so uh, I'll just pray and then we'll hand back to, to Roger. Let's pray together. Father God, we thank you for um, an opportunity to consider our spiritual life. Thank you, Lord, that you have given us within ourselves a conscience which 
which knows when things are wrong uh, between us. And so, Lord, uh, we come as broken sinners and we ask you to forgive us. We ask you to um, uh, take us back into your family and to uh, hold, our, hold us again in your love. And Lord, we trust you for this now and always in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Carl, thank you very, very much. Excellent. I, I, I sort of feel I'd like to listen to that again. There was so rich, so much in it. Thank you. Now, I think there are lots of questions, so we won't waste any time. It's over to Janice, who's, um, who takes the questions and will pose them to either Ruth or Dr. Carl. A couple of questions for uh, Ruth first. Um, what did you write in your article about speaking with a fleet of bone that caused people to complain? <laughs> Well, I, I think I wrote that if you're gullible enough to waste your money on it, then um, <laughs> more fool you. <laughs> uh, and a slightly more serious question. Um, have you any hints on how to guide someone through this situation who is an adult with autism and learning di disabilities, both that adult and the carer are Christians? Wow. Well, I'm sure if that person is an adult, then they probably know a lot more about it than me. Um, and uh, of course, uh, autistic spectrum disorder is very, very, there's a very wide range of um, uh, uh, conditions embraced by that, by that term. So some people who are on the autistic spectrum are, um, they don't have any um, learning impairment and, and some do. And I feel sure that those people, if they're Christians, they, they probably could write a book, they probably should, and they could probably teach me a thing or two. But all I know is that, um, again, we're all in it together. We're all made in the image of God. And um, those people who are unwell, vulnerable through any kind of disability are just as valuable in his sight they should be in the, the eyes of society too. And just as we're shielding people during this coronavirus epidemic, we should ex extend special, a special love and care um, towards people who have difficulties and their carers. Who cares for the carers? I'm sorry not to be much use really. I'm sure you could tell me a lot more than I could tell you. Thank you. Um, Carl. Why do you think that spiritual issues have been overlooked in this crisis, um, especially in the media? Um, well, I, I think that's a question for the media, but I, I don't think it's any surprise because as Ruth alluded to um, in her discussion on the, the abortion issue, I think that we do live in a, a time when, when people deny the spiritual in life. And so they, they do have this idea that we are just accidents, that we are just bodies and minds and there's nothing more to us. And, um, and I think that, come, that seeps out in everything. And uh, I think, you know, that we see it in, in lots of interviews. I think you do hear people, patients often talking about uh, spiritual experiences. And, and sometimes they're, 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 those things are, are pushed back by the interviewer as being unacceptable uh, topics for conversation. Um, and, uh, and also, I think as well, we haven't had much leadership um, from um, the, the church leaders or spiritual leaders. There's, there's no voice for them in our media, there's no room for people to, to really do that. Um, but thankfully, um, although the media have not done that, I think the internet has, um, and churches on the internet has opened that up for people. And I think that's been really one of the great things about this as an opportunity for people to perhaps explore spiritual, uh, spiritual things over the internet in an unthreatening way. So who knows what will come of that. Um, look on for Carl. Um, Paul said that for him to live is Christ and to die, to die is gain. How should a Christian live in the light of this in the current COVID crisis? Um, well, I, I, I think that um, I think that you know it's good to build up, um, build ourselves up in in our hope 
uh, in one of the things I've, I've been doing over this lockdown is actually doing a word study on hope in the Bible and, and seeing what the Bible actually teaches about hope and joy. Um, so that um, you're nourishing your soul on what the scriptures promise. And it's really it's really unusual um, in the West. We are, uh, you know, we're not used to suffering and we're not used to um, dealing with some of these issues, whereas our Christian brothers and sisters in other parts of the year, of the world, it's completely natural for them uh, to think about suffering and, and dying for their faith. And so, you know, they, they build themselves up on those uh, spiritual truths which prepare them for that. And the Bible is full of, um, of verses which should encourage us to bear suffering and, if necessary, to be willing to, um, uh, to die. And I think, you know, in our prayers and our times uh, alone with the Lord, that we can try and draw as close to him as possible. He is the good shepherd and he does lead and guide us wherever he calls us. And I'm sure that that's one of the opportunities of COVID, I think. I think what you said there possibly answers uh, another question, which was what can we do to decrease our fear and anxiety in the face of COVID-19? I think what you said there was, um, was very helpful. Yeah, I think it's very important to, um, to nourish ourselves in the scriptures and in prayer and fellowship. And, um, you know, if you're alone and you don't have anyone to con uh, to uh, to speak to about your fears, you know, s contact uh, Christian friends and spend a little bit of time uh, having fellowship and prayer uh, with them. And then I would read the, um, you know, do do read the scriptures and, uh, you know, look for verses you know get a concordance look up hope uh look up fear not and um you know sort of do a study on those things and nourish yourselves don't feed yourselves on the anxiety there's a, a verse in isaiah in isaiah 8 where god says to the prophet you know don't fear as the people around you fear don't uh, you know don't countenance that type of mentality make the lord your uh, sanctuary and uh, and he will be for you a, a strength and delight um, and so, um, you know, sort of the media would make us afraid. Mm. On, on that, Carl, I think I would just add, don't spend all day watching the news. I know. I, re I prescribe what news no more than once a day for patients who, uh, who ring up with anxiety, if needed. Um, Ruth, did you feel that being a doctor was a calling from God on your life? And if so, how did you know? No, <laughs> I was just good at maths and science <laughs> and um, very nosy, um, very, very, I like stories too. And I'm interested in pe people. I suppose it's very corny really, but I always like making people um, better. And uh, even I, I like to have animals and I still do like cleaning animals out. You know, we've got some animals and I like cleaning them out. I like making making things better and making things clean and comfortable. But I, I can't really truly say that I felt it was a calling of God on my life. I felt, I just feel so blessed that, um, that, I, that I was able to do what I always wanted to do and, um, and that I've enjoyed it so much. I have to say that being a GP is a tremendous privilege because uh, you get to know people over uh, over decades and then you get to know their children. And now I'm getting to know some of their grandchildren and great grandchildren as well. And, and I do hope I help my patients, but they certainly help me. I've had some difficult times in my life and um, their perspective and their prayers and their help and their kindness has helped me. Thank you. Well, one for you again and for Carl as well. How does experiencing what you see in your professional life affect you emotionally? I don't know whether Ruth, uh, well, I, I know for myself that, um, that you know, I, I do freak, I, I, as I get older, I, perhaps my empathy has increased, but um, I find a lot of things intensely moving. Um, uh, in surgery and um, and you know but I think it's uh, you know I think you have that, that's unavoidable 
um, I am able to leave those things behind. I don't know whether that's a skill you accumulate or just a defense mechanism, but um, I tend to find I'm most intensely moved when I'm with the person um, rather than on just reflecting on it afterwards. Um, and as Ruth said, praise God that we can pray and leave people with him because it's usually when we're completely helpless that we feel this most. Otherwise, we, we're fixing things. But, but when we can't fix things and, uh, that's, uh, and we're just faced with, um, with the mess of life, then um, you know, that's when um, prayer is very helpful for them, for the person and for us as well. Yes, I, I agree, and um, I'm, I'm not a very sentimental person, but I do sometimes feel things very deeply, even when I don't show it. Um, and one way I get round it, it doesn't sound very spiritual or helpful, really, but one way I get round it is I think I can't do much, but because I am a GP, I can do something. Um, even if it's only a tiny, tiny little thing, and even if it's only saying, I'm sorry, I don't know what to say, that's sometimes as good as it gets. And even saying that, acknowledging that somebody's suffering is so deep and so painful and so awful that nobody has a right to say anything clever, sometimes mm. that's enough. Mm. I must say that when I became a mother, I became a lot less capable of dealing with the emotional side of any kind of trauma. I think your brain goes to mush or something and uh, suddenly you think that could be my child and you suddenly feel people's pain a lot more. I'm going to step in there Janice if you don't mind. Thank you very much and uh, sorry if I didn't get around to everybody's questions but yeah back to you Roger. Yeah well we like to say we begin at eight and finish at quarter past nine but many many thanks obviously to Janice and to Hannah very grateful to you but especially to Ruth and Carl, we're deeply indebted to you. That was a tremendous evening and, and it was packed really with all sorts of bits and pieces. Yes, now look, <coughs> you can see on the screen there, if, if you would like, um, because you don't have a Bible or a New Testament nearby and you'd like um, a New Testament and Psalms, if you, if you get in touch with us at the address that was on the screen a moment ago, we'll gladly send you one. Uh, Carl prayed a prayer of commitment and faith and there's a little booklet called Trust in Christ, which explains what it means to become a Christian. It has a prayer very similar to the one that Carl prayed, a prayer of faith, repentance and commitment to Christ. And, uh, and then some tips about how to grow as a Christian, become stronger as a Christian. Um, uh, do, do write and ask for one. Thanks to Jonathan as well for the mention of um, the two books, um, um, uh, real lives and the one uh, everything a child should know about about God or every one a child should know about sorry um, it's a great book I really like that one anyway 10 of those have got those next week eight o'clock God willing we'll be interviewing Colonel Robbie Hall the week after we'll have this talk on the life of George Muller this remarkable 19th century man uh, and then the week after that a lady who's brought up as a Muslim in a Muslim country and how she became a Christian and uh, we, we, we'd love you to come and join us again, but if you can invite your friends as well, uh, please do so. Uh, I'm gonna pray a little prayer just to finish. Father, we thank you for tonight. Thank you for everybody who's joined us. We pray especially for Drs. Ruth and Carl. We pray that you'd help them, bless them in their medical work and in their Christian life and their families, we pray. And for each one gathered and some on YouTube as well, Lord, we, we, you know all our needs and thank you that you're a God who cares but a God who can cope. And we, we commit ourselves to you. We ask that you'd help us tomorrow, the Lord's Day Sunday. Many of us will be zooming into a church. Lord, bless those services, we pray. And as we go into a new week, that you'd go with us and help us in all things. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you and God bless you each one. Thank you.